Well, joining us on the line to discuss the future for ICOs is Jason Fernandez from AE Token. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Now we're going to jump straight in because what we've seen from November of this year is a very small amount of funding from ICOs. What does this mean for ICOs and as a theory that they may no longer be uh, prevalent and they may no longer get the companies gaining as they need to? Okay, so I think um, like crypto companies and blockchain companies have a built-in fundraising mechanism uh, in, the, in the ICO. And the lack of fundraise, uh, raise funds in the in the ICO industry isn't um, due in any specific part to the ICO as a fundraising mechanism specifically, but a lot of it has to do with like external factors. So I don't think we can discount things like contagion from the financial markets because we've seen um, gold go down this week. We've seen silver go down. The financial markets are down. Uh, the pound is down. Um, even oil prices have plummeted. So I think the ICO market will make a recovery, the same as dot-com companies have, but uh, it won't be soon. But if you if you think about it, you know, even Amazon went from a high of 86 and 99 to six dollars in 2001. So it's it's not uh, unheard of for, for this sort of things to happen. And you made a really good point when people notice the correlation between the different prices there. But do you think uh, ICOs will still be used as a crowdfunding mechanism for blockchain-based companies? Do you, still, do you still think it will be the preferred method here? Yeah, I do think so. Um, I think that, like I said, I think uh, uh, the whole mechanism of an ICO is is a sound mechanism. I mean, assuming uh, you have things like due diligence and, and and certain degrees, a certain degree of regulation, it's clearly a sound way to raise funds. Uh, I think a lot of the the people are staying away. You have a lot of uh, institutional investors that haven't quite gotten in yet, and uh, a lot of the people that were were jumping into the market just because of the fear of missing out. Those guys have left. So you're going to see that uh, you're going to see as institutional investors start coming back once the markets get better, um, you'll start seeing it as, as as a more legitimate. Like you'll start seeing more companies raising more money on ICOs, so they'll go back to normal. And you mentioned the current market conditions there. It's been very hard to ignore the current status that we have seen. With the current market conditions, do you think that actually a reversal is quite far away? So, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think, you're good. I think the reversal is at least three to six months away. Um, part of the reason, like I said, it comes down to a lot of the stuff going on with general financial conditions. But a lot of cryptos take their, uh, take their lead from Bitcoin and, and, and Ethereum and stuff. And Bitcoin and Ethereum have both been doing rather badly lately. Uh, but again, those things aren't because of any fundamental problems with Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's just because of uh, general market factors. So I think as Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of the top cryptocurrencies start rising, uh, start recovering a little bit, you're going to start seeing like other ICOs also raising money because that'll be a cue for other people to put in more money in the, into the, uh, the ICO industry. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your insight so far. There's plenty more to discuss, so we'll join with you later on in the show to take another look at this. Thank you, Jason. Sure. This is Blocks Live TV. Well, Jason Fernandez from AE Token joins us on the line for a second time. Now, Jason, 2018-17, we saw a massive amount of crowdfunding for ICOs. 2017 was a very good year. Unfortunately, that did mean that we did see some ICOs that were fortunate enter the space and cash out when they made the most of the, the positive market. Do ICOs now, in your opinion, do they have a bad name for themselves? Is it quite difficult for an ICO to brand themselves correctly? So I think it's important to draw a distinction between sophisticated investors and so-called smart money mm -hmm. and dumb mm -hmm. money. So people who get gone to the market due to fear of missing out, uh, those people will likely stay away for a while. But I think um, good, good, good companies with great teams will still get funded, uh, but it might not be like really soon. So I think that no, I think that uh, yes, yes, it has looked, it has affected cryptos. Um, in, uh, the, the general general public's impression of crypto in the near term, but over time that will recover and, and get back to normal. And what you're saying is more mature investors, people that understand the market a little bit better, have been less vulnerable to, to some of the risks that we did see in 2017 and early 2018 as well. Yeah, so a lot of the sophisticated investors also have money, you know, in other in 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 other in financial markets and you know in other securities and stuff like that. So generally, they've not been doing too well. Uh, so you're going to see them like less likely to put in money into crypto. But as that changes and as institutional investors come on board um, in the next year, 
um, you're going to start seeing like a lot of the guys that uh, were staying away because you know they uh, they were not so sophisticated. Once they start seeing the the sophisticated investors jumping back in, they're going to come back in as well. Fantastic. And I'd also like to get your opinion on FTAs because that's a phrase that we've heard a lot throughout the second half of 2018. Are we going to expect next year to see more people move towards STOs and that have more of an attraction? So I think there's been an enormous amount of hype uh, for STOs. And uh, while I think they'll start getting more common, uh, they're a different animal. I mean, the way they work is, is very different from an ICO. You're not giving out tokens that are used in the system. You're basically giving out, you know, uh, ownership of the company to some extent. So it's a different animal altogether. And the regulatory, the regulatory complications around filing for an STO are so onerous that one would think that if you were able to uh, get to that standard anyways, then you would probably just file an IPO. So I'm not really sure what the benefit of, of somebody doing an STO is when they already have they've already filed enough of the you know of the regulatory information that they could just do a, you know an IPO. So I, like I think there's a lot of hype in the industry, but like people started people have started to think that you can just swap out the word ICO for STO and life goes on, but they're completely different. And mm -hmm. and even the ICO advisors can't can't advise an STO because you have to be licensed in order to provide you know uh, in, uh, investment advice for security. So there it, it's not exactly a um, like you're going to replace ICOs and STOs. It doesn't work that way. I don't think so. And do you think a lot of this move towards STOs will move people just trying to shake off the bad reputation they heard from ICOs and also try to make the market bounce back in some way, add some optimism, add something new into the blockchain and crypto space? So I think, yeah, I mean, it's just it just comes down to it being like the hot new thing right now that, that people want to get into. But I don't like... Uh, I don't think that uh, it's it's a real um, replacement for ICOs. Like they're completely different funding mechanisms. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it might be a way to get people back into the market, but those guys are not going to be investing in ICOs necessarily if the, if their if their thing is STOs, and because it's a it, they're they would be investing um, in like essentially the functioning of the company as opposed to like owning owning part of the company. Great. Well, thank you so much for your insights so far and for clarifying everything. We'll join with you for a final time throughout today's show. Thank you, Jason. Sure. Thanks. This is Blocks Live TV. Initial coin offerings have continued to plummet amid the bear market. Latest statistics reveal that ICOs raised only $65 million in November. While this is a stark contrast with this year's best month for ICOs, when startups managed to raise a whopping $2.6 billion. This is a 97.5% drop and has been reported by DA. Clearly, investors are no longer looking at ICO projects, given they're not profitable. But another factor must be that over 75% of ICOs had vanished entirely. So November was a particularly bad month for ICOs, when considering that this year, token offerings have raised a total of just over $12 billion. September of this year was not so hot either, with only $180 million raised. Apart from the steep decline in crypto markets, regulatory scrutiny has also affected initial coin offerings. This year, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission clamped down on fraudulent ICOs and influencers promoting them. Among those fines were champion boxer Floyd Mayweather Jr. and musician DJ Khaled. The chairman of the SEC, Jay Clinton, also stated that ICOs are securities, although in the court case against Blockvest in California, his commission failed to prove that this was the case. Well, since then, there has been a number of ICO issuers who have come under fire from the SEC after being found to have been in violation of security laws. Despite that win for ICOs, experts believe this form of fundraising has indeed been petered out regulatory backlash fears. But there may be good news on the horizon, as many governments around the world have promised to deliver new regulations that could help ICOs find their spot in the pockets of investors. Let's look into this further with eToro senior analyst Matty Greenspan. November of 2018 has been difficult for ICOs, but how can they overcome some of the challenges they're faced with? Jason Fernandez joins us from A Token. Jason, jumping straight in, I'd love to get your input on some of the things that ICOs can do right now just to ensure their legitimacy um, and to help them with crowdfunding. We have noticed it's a difficult time right now. What kind of things can they do? 
I think one of the things that's really important is to reassure investors that they're like legitimate projects. So it's really important to have like a really good team, a team uh, where each person has a history that you can look at and you can look up. Um, also, it really helps when uh, the team members, uh, it, their LinkedIn profiles correlate with the companies that they're supposedly promoting because a lot of times you don't find that and then you if you're an investor, you start wondering whether that particular person really works at that company. And that's been a concern in the past because you've had like um, ICOs that have like listed certain people as advisors and those people have advisors. So you like I, I guess somebody who's doing an ICO will have to be really, really careful about promoting themselves, about making sh about transparency rather, and making sure that everybody who's who's investing has a has a general full full view of everything. But I think overall, it'd be a good idea for. Uh, for them to probably delay the ICO until like the market gets better if I would give them advice. Mm -hmm. And find the right time to, to do so and to proceed with that. Do you think as well that actually this will make crypto companies, we've heard about angel investors and, and the appeal of, of sourcing out angel investors at these kind of expos and conferences and getting an angel investor on board. Is that one of the only ways if ICOs were to persevere with, with looking to launch and crowdfund at this present time that they were to successfully reach their target? So ICOs, so sorry, angel investors have been part of uh, ICOs for a really long time. I mean, it's not just angel investors; it's also private money. So in the private sales, uh, in, in the private sales stage of an ICO, uh, a lot of the people that put in money are either like really rich angel investors, or you're looking at like some institutional investors. So that's already been the case for a while. And yes, you're right. I mean, if you if you if you are going to delay your public sale, um, it, it's really important for you to raise funds earlier on in order for you to like come up with a product because now if you're if you're if you're doing an ICO you can't really do an ICO with a with with uh, with just a white paper you know you need to have, at least have a mock-up or a prototype uh, you need to show that you know what you're, you're able to actually pull up what you're saying so the, the sooner the, the closer an ICO can get to that point in assuring po uh, potential investors the more likely they are to succeed and I think moving forward, what's your expectations for next year? What do you think will kind of make this, uh, make this evolve, make this industry mature in the way that a lot of people believe it does have potential to do? Yeah, so I think um, certainly uh, as, as the futures market starts picking up, uh, uh, Ethereum futures are on the horizon. There are a few other companies, there are a few other uh, uh, institutional um, moves happening in the space. So as institutional investors come back in, then you're going to start seeing a lot of like the unsophisticated investors like piling on. So it, there's a there's a multiplier effect where you have like a small group of investors like if they were to leave when they leave the ICO market and they stop investing, you're going to have like that much of a of a follow on effect. With the other people that were are just kind of following the institutional investors. So in twenty in in 2019, I expect to see a lot of more institutional investors getting in as, as the market becomes more regulated and that should follow with a lot of other people that are like not so sophisticated investors just trying to get on the bandwagon. So I expect that to happen. I expect it to recover probably within three to six months uh, in the new year. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. Always a pleasure catching up. Thank you for your time today, Jason. Likewise, thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all for myself and Jason. We'd love to hear how you found this interview. Are you an ICO that's struggling to crowdfund or are you an investor looking for the next opportunity? Share your thoughts with us on Blocks Live TV. This is Blocks Live TV.